mentioned, we are finishing uh, this series that we started a few weeks ago uh, about the end times. The series title, Is This the End or Not? And today, we're going to wrap it all up. We're going to put a bow on it, and then we're going to move on into our Christmas season. So, um, like I said, we are concluding this series about the end times and about the book of Revelation today. Over these past three weeks, we've covered a lot of information and I, again, I applaud you for sticking with it. I, I realize that, again, this, this series has been a little different. We haven't spent as much time necessarily uh, within the, the text, and that's likely what you were expecting. Um, but yet, instead, we have spent more time um, talking about, again, some tools that we need um, to, to properly read and interpret prophecy. Um, because, again, I hope that you've taken this information and used it um, to see what God says in Scripture about the end of the world. Okay, we started uh, this series in Matthew 24, right, where the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him this question at the beginning of Matthew chapter 24, and says, Jesus, tell us about the end of the world. What's going to happen? When is it going to happen? What should we expect? How will we know that it's coming? And they ask him these questions. And then Jesus goes into the rest of the chapter in Matthew 24 and gives them a bunch of things to, to kind of look at and things, some things to expect and, and, and all that. And then he concludes his teaching to them in Matthew 24 with these verses. And these verses have now become the theme uh, verses for this series where Jesus answers to them in verses 35 and 36. He says, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Now, as we look at these words of Jesus, based on these words of Jesus, if someone tells you that they know when the end of the world is going to be, they are lying to you. They, because at the very least, they have made an educated guess and they think that they are right but they really don't know, right? Because just as Jesus tells us in these verses, as he told the disciples that he himself does not know, that the angels don't know. And so how is any human being going to figure out what even Jesus himself does not know? Again, my personal opinion is that if someone does come out and publicly give a specific date, it guarantees that the world will not end on that day. Because if the Father did choose that day, then it would make Jesus' words not true. And I do not believe for one second that the Father would ever do that. Okay, so is this the end or not? Again, this is a question that is presented by this series and by the title of this series. Is it the end or not? The official answer, okay, we've got three weeks to get here. The official answer is we have no idea, right? We don't know. Okay, it could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen next week. It could happen in 50 years. It could happen 100 years from now. We do not know. Okay, and that is the official answer. I know, I think, wow, we wasted all that time to get to the fact that we don't know. <laughs> That's great. Okay, but what we do know is that the world is going to end as we know it. Right? And we also know that Jesus' words will never disappear. Right? That everything Jesus told us will always be true. So whenever the world does end, we know that everything that Jesus taught will be true. So if you know Christ and you are saved, ultimately it doesn't matter when the world ends. Again, I'm going to quickly go over the information, the tools that I've provided for you through these last few weeks on how to read and interpret prophecy. And again, the book of Revelation is, is a prophetic book. It is a prophecy. It is a style of literature. Okay, Revelation is not the only prophecy book in the Bible. In fact, that, that last almost half of the Old Testament is all prophecy scripture. And we will use these same tools, again, to read those scriptures as we do Revelation. So again, if you, if you heard the first few messages, this is review for you. You can probably already fill in the blanks already. Okay, if you didn't uh, hear those and this is new for you today, I encourage you, you can go back and listen to those other messages. They're available online. 
uh, through podcasts and video. Again, if you want further explanation into these, because I'm going to go over them quickly today, because again, for most of us, this is review. So again, prophecy, there are two purposes for prophecy in the Bible. The first purpose is foretelling prophecy, which is divinely inspired explanation of current or recent events. And then the other purpose is foretelling, divinely inspired predictions of future events. Again, both divinely inspired, and that's what prophecy is, is is a message that God gives to a specific person or a prophet, and then they are supposed to take that message and give it to the people that God tells them to give it to. Again, why we don't um, have prophets today is because we, as believers, have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can talk, talk directly to us through the Holy Spirit. And again, and that did not happen until Acts 2 at Pentecost. So before then, right, God used prophets, again, to to give these messages. So they're both divinely inspired, coming from God, right? And then these messages either of current or recent events or of future events. Okay, again, both foretelling and forthtelling prophecy is present in the book of Revelation. Okay, then we have three categories of prophecy, Okay, first is general prophecy, explains current situations when it was written. Again, general is exactly that, it's general. Okay, if it doesn't fit in one of the other two, then it is general. Okay, and, and again, it's a wide range of topics, a wide range of situations that are described within general prophecy. Uh, then the, the second category is messianic prophecy, descriptions of the chosen Messiah. Again, we as followers of Jesus believe that the chosen Messiah is Jesus Christ. Okay, that he was the Messiah that was sent. Okay, and again, any prophecy explaining the Messiah is Messianic prophecy. A, a easy example of this, a Messianic prophecy, um, is a, there's a lot of Messianic prophecy in the book of Isaiah. And so again, which is why we read a lot of verses from Isaiah during the Christmas season, right? Because a lot of those prophecies were fulfilled in the birth story, in the Christmas story. Again, a, a good example of general prophecy is the story of Jonah, you know, Jonah and the whale. Again, he was given a message, Jonah was a prophet, to the city of Nineveh. It was general prophecy in that moment. So a general prophecy, messianic prophecy, and then the last category is end times prophecy. And again, prophecy foretelling events regarding the end times and the end of the world. Again, all three of these categories are also present in Revelation. So when we read it for ourselves, we have to constantly be asking, what purpose is this? What category is it? And did it switch? We must ask these questions first before we try to figure out what it is, what it means or what it's trying to tell us. If we get the purpose and the category wrong, then we end up with an incorrect meaning. Okay, then last week, again, we looked at the four most common ways that Revelation is interpreted and what each view mainly believes about the end of the world. Again, before we go through these, uh, remember the end times is something that is left very vague within Scripture. This is a secondary issue. It is one that Christians can agree to disagree on and all still be Christians. The end times, again, is not a salvation issue. It is a secondary issue. They also remember that these are very broad categories, and each one has varying opinions within each view. Uh, And so, again, you you could have two people that even agree on one of these views and still disagree on on finer details of that. So here are the four different um, common views and of interpretations of Revelation. First uh, is this, is the historicist view. There is no common name for this, for this uh, viewpoint. According to this viewpoint, the text is symbolic of real events. These events span throughout the history of the church from Christ's ascension until the final judgment. As time has continued to pass, more and more history has shown that this view is not as valid as once thought. Uh, and for the most part, this viewpoint of Revelation um, has been disproven. And so this one, again, is not a very popular view um, or modern view of Revelation. The second view of uh, viewpoint is a preterist view or a post-millennialism view. There are, again, a ver- very, several varying opinions within this, uh, this viewpoint, kind of known as a full preterist or a partial preterist. 
According to this viewpoint, much of the tribulation took place in the first century with the rise and the fall of Rome. And this view also believes that the entire world will be evangelized before Christ returns. And then the next, uh, the next view is the idealist or spiritualist view or amillennialism or amillennialism okay, is the common name for this view. Again, according to this view, no specific events are described in Revelation. Instead, it is the bigger picture of God versus evil. And the book is made up primarily of symbolic language. The world will continue in its downward spiral while history repeats itself until God decides enough is enough that the human heart will get, get no further away from him. And then he then decides to come back and to end the earth. And we go straight to the uh, white throne judgment. And then the last view is the futurist view or the dispensationalism view or premillennialism view. Again, within this view, there's a lot of varying opinions. There's a classic dispensationalist, a progressive dispensationalist, um, and many others. This view believes that there will be a secret rapture of the church, followed by a literal seven-year tribulation before Christ returns to live on earth for an additional, an, an additional thousand years before the final judgment is, uh, happens. Again, typically, when you look at these views, um, the end times discussion boils down to two main schools of thought, and that is there is a rapture or there is not a rapture. Okay, and those they boil down to to those uh, to one of those two categories. Okay, and in fact, that is tends to be the hot button topic that people tend to focus on as they discuss their end times view. Again, no matter which view you believe to be most true. The important thing is that you let scripture guide you to your conclusion instead of finding scriptures to support your predetermined opinion. Again, we move to scripture first, scripture, scripture, scripture. Before we look at any person's opinion, we want to look at God's opinion and what he put in his word. Okay, the key to any of these views okay, is, um, is to whether the text is literal or figurative and when it switches between literal and figurative, when it switches between categories and purposes. Again, all Bible scholars in all four of these views agree that, that, that there are parts of Revelation that are figurative. There are parts of Revelation that are, are, um, are literal. There are, and all three categories and both purposes are present in the book of Revelation. The difference between these views is when it switches. So as we conclude this series, as we look at all this information and look at all these views, again, as I want to wrap it up today, we're going to put a bow on it, and then we're going to move on into the Christmas story. Okay, as we wrap it up today, okay, now I want to answer this question, this first question, now what do I do with all of this information? Okay, why, why did we spend some time on it? Why is it important? Okay, and so again, I want to answer that, that question, look at that question today. And when we do that, I want to read from Revelation chapter 21, okay, verses 1 through 8. So if you have your own Bible with you today, I invite you to open with me to Revelation chapter 21. If you do not have your own Bible or don't have it with you today, there are Bibles provided for you in the seat pockets. I, I invite you to open one of those. In fact, there, you notice on the outline is the page number of where you can find this passage in that Bible. And again, if this is one of the easiest passages to find in the, all of the Bible, because you just open the back cover, flip a couple pages in, um, and you'll find Revelation chapter 21. And so we're going to read again verses 1 through 8 in Revelation 21, verse 1, where it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, from the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. And all of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now I want to stop there, and again, as we read here in Revelation 21. Okay, I just want to, again, read this, this, this biblical description of heaven. Okay, and if you continue to read the rest of Revelation 21, is John goes on to describe this holy city. Okay, and this is the most vivid description of heaven in all of Scripture. Okay, and as we read and hear this text this morning, okay, as I will say, is this is where we end up. Okay, no matter which view you believe, or even if you decide I'm not even going to take a stance on a view, we all end up here. And here we see God wins. Right? Evil is dealt with eternally, right? And this description of God God's unhindered presence with us as his creation for eternity in heaven. Right? We all end up here. We all are here. Now, as we read this scripture, okay, this describes the destination of our journey. This is where our journey ends. We are on this faith journey, and this is our destination. Now, obviously, we get here, we are in God's unhindered presence, and then we start a whole new journey with God, right? But our, our earthly journey, as we know it, our faith journey ends here. Now, as we realize that, I, I hope that this description is motivating to you. I hope that it's encouraging to you. Right? I hope that it puts into perspective this conversation about end times, that this is ultimately what matters, that this is the destination of our journey. Right? As, as we realize that, again, I hope it's motivating to you in, in, in a few ways. Number one is I hope it motivates you to keep journeying in your faith. Right? To realize we have not experienced this yet, which means our journey of faith is not over. Until we are with God in his unhindered presence in heaven, as described in Revelation 21, we have to keep journeying in our faith. We have more to learn. We have more to figure out. We have to take that next step. I hope it motivates you to keep journeying. Okay, but also, I hope it also motivates you to realize that a part of that journey is to share this truth with other people. Because verse 8, again, tells us not only our own motivation of why we continue to grow with Christ, try to continue to journey, but verse 8, again, that describes this eternal lake of burning sulfur, okay, tells us, right, that if we do not end up with God in heaven, that that is the eternal destiny. Again, that, and that was not made for humans at all. That was made for Satan and his demons, right? And the heart of God is that no human will ever go there, right? Which means it motivates us to not only us, for us to not go there, right? But also to share the truth of who Jesus is with everybody who is destined for that place right now. All right, so I hope it's motivating to you. I hope it's motivating to you to continue to grow in your own faith, but also to share your faith to make sure, that, again, that you can do everything you can do, and I'm going to do everything I can do to make sure that nobody goes there. Because this is when Jesus, as described in the Gospels, he says, this is where God will separate the sheep from the goats. Right? And the heart of God, and I hope as we continue to journey and take on the heart of God, right, continues to motivate us to say, I must share Jesus. Because his words will never disappear. Right? And, and this, again, is very clear in scripture. End times is vague. Right? But the way of salvation is not. And the words of Jesus, as he gives it to us in scripture, is very, very clear. So as we look at that in Revelation 21, this is the destination. This is our motivation to keep going. 
Okay, but as we as we talk about end times, again, I, I have encouraged you over and over again through this series to read the scripture yourself. Okay, and, and so that again, what do I do with this? Well, that's kind of the first answer to the question. Read it yourself. Read scripture yourself, read Revelation yourself, and then use extra biblical resources. Start with God's opinion. And then again, based on however, you know, the Holy Spirit leads you, whatever conclusion you come to, whichever road you end up down in one of these popular views, then move on to extra biblical resources. But first and foremost, take the skills you have learned over these past few weeks and read it yourself. Again, I'm not going to take a poll of hands to ask how many people have actually read it themselves. Okay, but I know that some of you have because we've had conversations about what you've read. Okay, and again, that was ultimately my goal is I want you to read it yourself and let's talk about what you read. Okay, now, again, if you've actually read it, again, thank you. And I hope that you'll continue to work through it. If you haven't, I hope that you will. Okay, but start with scripture. Right, and, and move to scripture before you read anything else. Because there are a lot of extra biblical resources, right? Meaning resources about end times that are not the Bible. Okay, there are lots of them out there. There are literally thousands and thousands of titles on the book market. Okay, oh, there are, uh, whether it's books, articles, sermons, I mean, you, you can, again, there, there's endless supply, okay, of them out there. Okay, in fact, you can go into Amazon, any bookstore, and you can find all kinds of popular titles, right, that are focused on this question of the end of the world and what's really going to happen, okay? But before you turn to any of these or even read, and it's okay to read these, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But before you do that or turn to those resources, I hope that you will read it yourself, okay? And know that anything you read other than scripture Okay, is that what this, this author has done, whoever wrote that book, whoever wrote that resource, whoever wrote that commentary, whatever it is, is they have already worked themselves, worked through this and, and decided what, what their view of the end times is. And now they are writing from that viewpoint. And so before you read the book, I tell you this and these ones that are on the screen right now are a mix of the different viewpoints. Okay, and again, there are some coming from all the different ones. And so again, if you start with scripture, then move to these, know that any apocalyptic literature is someone's opinion. Hey, if it's not scripture in God's opinion, then anything other than scripture about end times is, is someone's opinion. Okay, and they are coming from one of these biases, from one of these viewpoints. Okay, and so just know which, which they're coming from. Okay, whether you pick up a left behind book or the apocalyptic code, or any book other than the Bible, know what that author's opinion is, and which of the four views they are writing from. Again, I hope you've seen through these last three weeks that there's not much about the end times that is hard fact. Okay, I know we all want to know for sure what will happen, when it's going to happen, but the cold, honest truth is that we don't know, and it's left very vague in Scripture. Again, there are lots of holes to fill in, which is exactly why we have differing views and also why we have so many titles that we can read. Again, why did God leave it vague? Okay, again, that, that's a very logical question for us to ask, right? Why did God leave it vague? Um, there are things in scripture, again, that are very clear, that are known as fact, that are absolute truth, but end times is not one of them. Obviously, we don't know why God left it vague, and we won't know until we can ask God in heaven, and quite frankly, at that point, we won't care. Right? However, as I think about this, I've come up with a few reasons why I think maybe God left it vague. Okay, again, maybe God just wanted to see how far off we could be from the truth. You know, maybe he's like, you know, okay, God sat back, right, and says, hey, this should be pretty funny. Let's have John write this down and see how bad the humans can mess it up. Uh, now, I believe that God has a sense of humor, right? But I also, I don't want to put those words in God's mouth. I don't know if that's really what God did or not. I have no idea. Right? Again, maybe God just wanted to sit back and watch Bible scholars argue. Okay? And that they have done. Maybe he just wanted to give us something to obsess about. Again, I don't know why God left it vague. 
right? But I do trust that God had a good reason for leaving it vague. Okay, truthfully, if I did know exactly how the world was going to end, and especially when the world was going to end, I wonder if I would live for God the same way that I do now, not knowing. Because I know that I would be tempted to just squander my life away and repent just a few days or a few hours before the end was coming. And I think that there would be many others that would choose that same path. And since we don't know, we need to do exactly what Jesus tells us to do, and that is live for him every day. To always be prepared for the end. Right? Because we don't know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It might be not even in my lifetime. And again, as we talk about the end times, again, read what others believe about the end times, but yet it ultimately comes back to what is my bias? All right, what do I believe about the end times? What has God led me to conclude? Because we all have a bias, no matter what. Because your own opinion, your own experiences, with the things that you've been taught, they all go into your bias. Again, if your view of scripture is different because of all of these factors, and everyone brings a bias into how they read God's word. And anything you read other than scripture has a bias. And I'll tell you again, just here's a, a little start on some knowing those biases, okay? One is if anything that you pick up or read by Tim LaHaye, who is a very popular best-selling author right now. He's, he's co-authored many, many best-selling books, including the Left Behind series. Okay, his bias is dispensationalism. Okay, anything you read by the him or his buddies are coming from that bias. Okay, there's another best-selling author. Again, the, his name is Hank Hanegraaff. He has several books out about end times. He is a best-selling author in many things, not just end times, and he is also a prominent radio personality. He has a radio show called The Bible Answer Man. Okay, and he has several published books, including several about the end times. His bias is on millennialism. Anything you read by him or anything that his name is attached to you is coming from that bias. So try as best as you can to put aside your own bias and let the scripture text and the Holy Spirit guide you to a conclusion. Again, just as I said last week, some people, again, look at all this and say, you know what, my conclusion is I am going to be a pan-millennialist, right? Is however it pans out, I'm going to be fine. Okay? And if that's your conclusion, if you just decide, you know what, I don't have to take a position, right? Again, and that's even okay, okay, to be there as long as you know Christ as your Savior, right? Then you are on the side that wins because God wins. Which brings me then to my last point that I want to give you. What do I do with this? Okay, well, and that is this, is know that end times is not a salvation issue. Okay, this is a secondary issue. Again, we can talk, we can, we can work through, we can interpret scripture, we can talk about our bias, but no matter what your bias is, okay, is that it should not affect your salvation. The book of Revelation was originally written to a Christian audience, and John was not worried about their salvation, and his assumption was that they were already saved. So if you are trusting an end time view to make your salvation decision, then you are focusing on the wrong thing. Because end times is left vague in scripture, but the way of salvation is not vague in scripture, not even close. It is crystal clear. Again, the words of Jesus will never disappear. Right? John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he sent his son to not to condemn the world, but to save it. Those words will always be true. Right? And that is the way of salvation. Again, and as we realize that fact, I want to end this series on one more incredibly bold statement of Jesus of words that will never disappear, and that is John 14, 6. When Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one can come to the Father except through 
me. That is not vague. That is very clear. Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. Right? We have to receive him as our savior to be saved. We will not end up with God in his unhindered presence in Revelation 21 without Jesus Christ. We cannot be good enough to get there on our own. Right? The wages of sin is death. And without Jesus stepping in and paying our price by living a sinless life here on earth, by dying on a cross, by rising again on the third day, right, and paying for our sin debt once and for all, right, we we can't save ourselves. That's why he's the way. He provided the way. Okay, and first and foremost, we have to know that that is true because that is true no matter what. No matter what end times view you hold, those words do not change. And so my hope for you today is that you can leave here not knowing for sure what the end times is going to be because the official answer is we have no clue. Right, But I do want you to leave here today knowing that you are saved and that you don't have to worry or be scared or live in fear about when the end times happen or what will happen or what the details are going to be or what they're not going to be. Hey, know 100% without a shadow of a doubt that you are saved through Jesus Christ. So if you're here today, again, um, and you know Christ as your Savior, you receive him as your Savior, I hope that you leave from here being encouraged to continue to journey forward, to be more like Christ tomorrow than you are today, right? And continue to journey your journey of faith. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, I hope that you will receive Christ as your Savior today before you leave. Hey, because he is, uh, he is the way. Right? And, and again, you can just accept him into your life, open your life, can, you can simply pray to God in your seat or come forward to the altar or have somebody pray with you. Right? But just say, hey, I, again, just a simple prayer. Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he lived on this earth, he died and rose again to forgive my sins. Lord, forgive my sins. Come into my life and save me. Right? That simple prayer is all it takes. And you can pray that in your own head. It's your seat today before we leave. But no matter what, I hope you will leave here today knowing that God wins and you are on God's side. So here's my final thought this morning on end times. When it comes to Revelation and end times, I hope you will read it yourself, study it, and come to your own conclusions. Again, let God and the Holy Spirit guide you Right, turn to God's opinion first and then turn to other people's opinions. And again, as you can tell, I have not told you my opinion. Because I don't want you to turn to my opinion. I want you to turn to scripture. Okay, and so again, I purposely not told you my opinion. And I, I have a bias. I know what my bias is. Okay, but I'm also not going to share it with you from the stage. Okay, because I want you to turn to scripture first and turn to God. Okay, so again, when it comes to Christ we know for sure how we're saved. I hope that you'll, you will, will not leave here today worried about the end times or not sure about your salvation.